vectors. Wait, what? No, not your Fortnite vectors. No, 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 not your Survive vectors. No, not your like graphics design vectors. No, we're talking about arrows. Yeah, arrows are way more interesting than all that nonsense vectors you were thinking of. Hello everybody, I'm Prar, and today we're going to be talking about arrows, like really, really cool arrows that you can do a lot of stuff with. They're called vectors, and the reason why they're so important is because they're super, super fundamental to physics. Alright, you're probably wondering, what's so special about a plain arrow that's just, like, what? It's just an arrow. So let me explain. So first thing first, a vector is a magnitude and a direction. So you both have to have how long the vector is and which direction it's pointing in. And the reason why it's so important is because it's basically everything in physics. Because it's like, for example, velocity, acceleration, force, all vectors. So today, I'm going to be focusing on how to intuit slash think about how vectors work. This is because when I first learned vectors, I was so confused. I was like, what? How do you add an arrow plus an arrow? I thought it was like one of those things where it was like 2 plus 2 equals fish or something, I don't know. It didn't make any sense to me. I didn't understand how vectors work at all, and I was just staring at the textbook, and I was like, why can't I do a single problem in this? But once you understand vectors, every single problem gets easier. Like, literally, just take any problem from any chapter of the book, and it'll become infinitely easier once you have a good grasp of vectors. Alrighty, so the first step to understanding vectors is understanding how we represent them. So as you probably already know, and as I probably already made fun of, vectors are just arrows, right? An arrow. Hooray. Very cool. But what we could do is we could represent it in two important ways. So there's other ways to do it, but like there's two ways that you should know. The first one is component form. So if this vector, for example, is like a 1 by 2 vector, so it goes right 1 and 2 up, then we could just represent it as a 1 comma 2. Let's make it a little bit more interesting and make it go up by root 3 instead of 2. Alrighty, then our component form will no longer be this, it'll be 1 comma root 3. But there's another form we could put this in. We could say that our vector, instead of just being 1 right and root 3 up, we could say that it's just 2 in a certain direction. But how do we define that certain direction? The way we tell someone what that certain direction is, is by defining the angle from the horizontal. Which, we know, because this is a 30, 60, 90 triangle, is 60! Wow! So basically what we could do is we could say this vector has magnitude 2 and direction of 60 degrees from the horizontal. So basically these are the two ways to represent it. So basically the way I like to think about vectors is that they're like orders. It's like AU, go right 1 and then up root 3. That's exactly the same thing as telling that dude to just go turn 60 degrees then go 2. It's exactly, exactly the same. And that's why these are two exactly same vectors that we're representing here. Alright, now that we understand what a vector is, it's basically just a magnitude and a direction, we now have to understand what we could do with these vectors. So, in today's video, we're just going to be focusing on vector operations. So, give me, let me give you an example. Alrighty, so the first thing first is what happens if we take the negative of a vector? So, a vector is like an order, right? We tell this guy to go this way. If you tell him to negative do that, that's like telling him the exact opposite. So it's basically telling him to go this way. So it's the exact same length of vector, except we're telling him to go the opposite way. The reason why the vectors are exact opposites is because if we tell the guy to do this, right, this is our first order, then if we want to undo the order, we just do this. We tell him to go up that much, and then we tell him to go down that much, and it's undone. So that's how I think about negating, it's just undoing an order. Next, addition. No, it's not equal to fish, okay? Just because I thought that doesn't mean it's right. So, we're just going to add some vectors. So let's say we have the epic vector like this. And then we want to add another vector. That's like that. So we think about this like an order, right? We first tell our guy to do this, right? So we start from over here, and our guy goes over here. But then, after we tell him that first order, we tell him the second order. So we tell him to go over there. But that's exactly the same thing as telling this guy to go straight up over there. So basically, this is just equal to going like that. Whoa, it's crazy. So you can probably see that like if you add the two first two orders up, you get the equivalent order is just telling him to immediately do the longer vector that we end up with. And thus, these two vectors sum to the third vector. Very cool. Now vector addition is pretty pretty darn important because if for example you want net force or result in velocity, you both have to use these addition things. Cause let's say like your boat or something is moving to the right on a river. So your river is like this and you're trying to cross the river, right? 
but then the river trolls you and it's like, hey, I'm gonna go down. So the river's flowing down, so your boat gets pushed this way. So if your boat's going this way, and then the river's pushing it this way, then what's its overall speed? It's basically just summing the two, because it's moving one way and the river's moving it down. So its overall velocity relative to the ground would just be like that. Let's say that we have like a bunch of forces on a block. Then how do we find what the overall force is? We usually just add all the force vectors. So basically you can see that these two are like approximately canceling out this one. So this just adds up to zero. And then we know that our block is not accelerating. It's crazy. So once you understand how vector addition works, you can do all these kinds of problems. I'll go into these problems in more detail in later videos if you guys want. But basically just understand how vector addition works because it's super applicable to other types of problems. All right, subtracting vectors is literally the same thing. It's basically you have a vector and you subtract this other vector that's like that again, right? It's basically saying that we do the first order and then we undo the second order. So if the second order is telling us to go this way, we're like, nope, we're not going to listen to that. We're going to do the exact opposite. So we go the other way. And then the final answer would just be connecting the starting point to the ending point. So if our starting to ending point, it looks like this vector, then our answer is literally just that vector. Now, honestly, I don't really like subtraction per se, because basically what you could do is you could just say you're adding a negative vector, because this is basically the same as this plus negative of this. And then we already know how to negate it. We already know how to add it. So there's no reason to learn a completely new like subtraction thing and remember how that works too. Just add a negative vector. Alrighty, we got two more interesting things. First off first, we got the dot product. Alright, so what's so cool about this dot product? Well, it's kind of abstract when you first think about it. But once you get the hang of it, it's super super useful. So basically what the dot product is saying is that if you have two vectors, let's say like this boy and this boy, it's basically multiplying the parts of the vectors that are going in the same direction. So specifically, like this vector is going in this direction, right? Like in this direction. But like part of this vector is like going in some completely other direction. But we know that this vector is the same as like this vector plus this vector. So basically what dot product does is it multiplies this component of the original vector times this vector. Okay, that was confusing. That was pretty like, ugh. So we're gonna have a concrete example. Let's do this. All right, let's say we have a block, right? My man the block over here, my man M, he basically moves from here over there to the new position. So he moves like that. But let's say that there's a force over here. Let's call the displacement X real quick. So what we notice here is that only part of the F actually helps it move like X. Like the vertical part of the F doesn't do anything. It's pretty useless, right? So we don't want to consider that when we're multiplying f by x. So basically what the dot product does is it gets rid of that extra like vertical part. It says the only part that helped was this part that's in the same direction as the x. So this is a f helping. So if we want to multiply them together, we get f helping times x. And this turns out to be the work. This kind of makes sense, right? Because like the vertical thing that's not even in the direction of motion didn't help do any work on the block. Only the thing that helped it move that x distance helped it work. So that's why work is f helping times x, which is exactly the same by the definition of dot product as f dot x. So how would you calculate this? That is a question. Let us do an example. So let's say you have a vector of like length 2 and then another vector of length 3 and then this is like a 30 degree angle. And we want to find the dot product, right? So first we have to find the length of the vector that's in the same direction of the other vector. So we drop our perpendicular and then we're like, hey, this bottom vector plus this vector over here sum to our two vector. But we only want the part of the vector that's going in the 3 direction, right? So the way we would do that is just 2 cosine 30 and then you get this length over here, so 2 cosine 30. And then by the definition of dot product, we had to multiply by the other vector, which is 3. So basically our answer would just be 6 root 3 over 2 is equal to 3 root 3. Very epic. If these vectors were in component form, there'd be another way to do this. So let's say that our flat vector is just 3, 0, right? Because it goes right 3 and up 0 then our other vector would be root 3 comma 1. Okay, now if we wanted to find the dot product, what we basically do is we just take this times this 
plus this times this, and we get our answer. So we get 3 root 3 plus 0 times 1 is equal to 3 root 3. And we get the same answer. This is insane. This is almost as insane as 2 plus 2 equals fit. Okay, I should stop using that example, huh? Fine, 4 plus 4 equals top hat. Be that way. Okay, anyway, that's enough for dot product. Let's move on to the next and final operation we gotta know. Cross product. Alrighty, cross product is a lot more easy to understand because it has a geometric, like, definition. It's basically the opposite of dot product too. It's basically saying we multiply the forces such that they're in perpendicular directions. Dot product was parallel, cross product is perpendicular. So for example, if we have this and we have this, in dot product we multiply like this component times the other vector. But this time, we multiply this component times the other vector. It turns out that this is just the area of the parallelogram over here. So basically, cross product is just finding the parallelogram's area. Now why is this useful? So let's say we have a wheel, right? Or let's say we have a rock and it's anchored at this dot over here. Then if we have a force that's pulling on it this way, the component of that force that's pulling up is not gonna do anything, it's just gonna pull on that pivot point and nothing's gonna happen. But the other component that's pulling this way will actually force the rod to rotate. So in this case, we only wanna care about the part that's perpendicular to the rod. So let's say the rod is a vector and the vector is like R. Then basically what we could do is we could do F cross R to get torque, which is basically like the force for turning. Alrighty, let's do an example of how to calculate the cross product. So let's do the same example as the other one we did for dot product. So we have our 2, we have our 3, and we have our 30 degrees. So instead of using the parallel component, we use the perpendicular component, which we know is like 1. So basically it says 1 times 3 equals 3. But we can also do it using the component form. So we had it 3, 0, and was root 3, comma 1. Instead of doing dot product, which is like parallel, we do this one plus this one. That's actually kind of cool. So you do 3 times 1 plus 0 times root 3 and you get 3 again. But the interesting thing about cross product is that it's a vector. So it's not just like 3. It also has a direction. So what is that direction? It's just a direction that's perpendicular to both these vectors. So it's basically like sticking out of the page, kind of. But let's not worry about this too much because the direction of the cross product really isn't that important for FMA. It gets more important in like later levels, but you don't really have to know about it for AP Physics 1 or for FMA. The calculation itself is important though, so know that. All right, epic. Those are the four vector operators you gotta know. I hope my intuition like helped you guys understand it a little bit more. I know I didn't completely explain how vector components work, so I'll try to explain that in a future video. But I hope you guys found this useful. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you guys enjoyed. As always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe for more. Let me know down in the comments if there's any more physics crash course videos you guys want me to make. Other than that, thank you guys so much for watching again. And see you guys next time.